Um, I don't usually put up something with the medical uh, side of things, but Stan's already mentioned it, and it does play into my topic this morning. Um, I'm going to share a message, uh, actually, that I, I wrote last year. Uh, it comes out of lockdown last year, actually. So I, I gave this message for the first time, uh, staring down the barrel of my iPhone as we were all doing those online services. And so anyone who had to record anything, never mind a, a sermon, but just any message you had to give, um, uh, just there's something about having to record a sermon that is infinitely more difficult than just giving one live. And so I'm, I'm glad to be able to actually give this uh, sermon live. And I, I want to pick up on some of the themes uh, from that, because some of the themes from that have remained. And I find some of those themes return to me uh, every winter. And so that's why I've uh, sort of dusted this off in, uh, in July to, to give again. I am going to hit you with a lot of information, and so please don't try to follow everything. Uh, I've got sort of three points, and then some of those three points split off into four sub-points. Um, some sermons are there so that you can pick up everything along the way, and other sermons are just designed to take you on a journey and then plop you somewhere at the end. And so just enjoy the journey and the plopping at the end. Uh, don't try to um, follow it all the way through. Every year, the Oxford English Dictionary uh, puts out their word of the year. Uh, some of you might have uh, been aware of that. Uh, so the Oxford English Dictionary is the, the largest and the most uh, kind of comprehensive collection of words in the English language. And so one of their sort of just more fun aspects is that every year they put out, what's our word for the year? What's the, the word that sort of burst onto the scene uh, for this year? And they talk a bit about it, talk about why they've chosen it, give you a couple of runners up uh, to that word. For 2020, they said, we just can't do it. It's been such a year that they put out an entire report of words for 2020. The report was called Words of an Unprecedented Year, kind of giving a nod to what their word of the year really was, uh, which was unprecedented, and most of us found that by sort of March, we had overused that word and were sick of hearing it. But I just thought I'd run through what some of the words uh, were uh, from that. So here we go. COVID-19, coronavirus, and COVID just exploding uh, into our kind of consciousness uh, through February into March, April, May, June. You've got the, the sort of use and the, the uh, extra uses of those words. Pandemic and epidemic, uh, again, went uh, through the roof, particularly pandemic. I think epidemic was probably people Googling like I had to, what's the difference between pandemic uh, and epidemic? Social distancing, physical distancing, phrases that really weren't being used in this kind of way prior uh, to the changes that happened in our lifestyles um, through sort of March and April, uh, May of last year. Uh, wet market. Who knew what one of those was <laughs> before February, March or April? Regardless of how COVID-19 uh, came to be, uh, and uh, you know nothing's been kind of proven from that, but everyone sort of wanted to know, what is this kind of wet market uh, rumour that's flying around? Remotely, a word that just took off from, uh, through February and into March and into April, and uh, some people are still enjoying uh, some work remotely. And then one of my favourites, unmute, uh, just <laughs> exploded into our consciousness uh, around about the same time as we started to work remotely. Um, yeah, who even had ever used that word uh, prior to then, uh, I don't know. I don't know why it was even getting this amount of use here. Um, maybe some translated, Jesus unmuted him. Um, a bit of gospel humor for you there. Uh, it wasn't all to do, though, in the re report uh, to do with COVID-19. There were other reasons why they justified having to put out a whole uh, report for this. Um, they talked about the, the bushfires, the climate changes, Black Lives Matter, uh, there was talk through most of 2020 of impeachments or acquittals, um, the rise of cancel culture. They just covered all of these in the report saying there's no way we could have a single word uh, for 2020. It was quite uh, the year. 2020 wasn't just captured in words. There were memes with 2020 when it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, or even your year for f fans of friends. Hashtag 2020. Um, I quite like this one. Me being prepared for 2020. 2020. <laughs> so I... Gotcha. If I had a word for 2020, it would be grumpy. 
And really my journey uh, through that uh, and the panel beating that the Lord did in me (laughs) during that time uh, can probably be best summarized by the title I've given uh, to my talk this morning, which is Grumpiness and Gratitude. Um, This really was something that uh, came out of those lockdowns, and I'll explain sort of how that um, unfolded. Uh, But as I do that, I just want to read a couple of passages out that will kind of form the backdrop and give you the the kind of the the holy backdrop of grumpiness and gratitude before I plunge into my less holy uh, personal journey through it. James 1, 2 to 4. If you want to know what a panel beating feels like across four short chapters, then James is your man. He just moves so swiftly from challenge to challenge. Uh, you've, you've barely got time to sort out the last thing he had a go at, like your tongue, and he's having a crack at your finances. He is just literally going through, uh, it's often called the, uh, the wisdom literature of the New Testament, the kind of the Proverbs. It's short, it's snappy, it's punchy, it's to the point. Everyone's going right into your solar plexus, uh, kind of sorting you out. So here he is. Consider it a sheer gift, friends. When tests and challenges come at you from all sides, you know that under pressure your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well, def- uh, and well developed, not deficient in any way. A passage from Paul that's uh, similar out of Romans 5, 3 to 5. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. These are passages that are quite the challenge to us uh, when your two options are grumpiness or gratitude. And there's a sort of a movement uh, between those. There was a song, I mean, you you see Paul move so swiftly uh, from those challenges through to we can't contain everything God's done for us. There was a song um, that I learned in Sunday school in the 1980s, in the early 80s, uh, and it went like this. Are you humbly grateful or grumbly hateful? What's your attitude? Do you grumble and moan or let it be known you're grateful for all God's done for you? Which one are you? That song came back to me when I was going through the the kind of episode that I'm about to describe, and it came through with startling clarity, and I could remember all of the lyrics. Now, mercifully, you're not going to find out whether I remember the tune, but I could recite all of the lyrics to that song. What I'm going to do, though, this morning is spend some time unpacking the kind of two uh, ends of the spectrum. As Stan mentioned, before I moved kind of sideways into theology, I worked as a doctor. And one of the most basic things that you learn as a, at medical school is the difference between a symptom and a diagnosis. A patient might come to you convinced that they need antibiotics for their sore throat. But sore throat isn't a diagnosis. It's the presenting symptom. You need to establish why the throat is sore and then what treatment plan best fits that why. And that really is what the rest of medical school and well beyond is mostly about. It's not all just about that, but mostly it's about learning the art of correctly diagnosing and then treating the why. Our simple throat example would proceed something like this if we were actually, uh, you were presenting uh, with that. You ask questions about that presenting symptom. You ask for the location of the pain, the duration, the nature uh, of the pain. Secondly, Uh, You ask about the presence, or just as important, the absence of other symptoms. Does it come with a headache, chills, runny nose, cough, rash, or difficulty swallowing? These are all questions that you might have been asked before uh, when you've turned up at your GP complaining of a sore throat. Thirdly, you might gather further information by, um, you you gather further information by uh, examining the patient. Now, these aren't called symptoms, these are called signs. These are your findings uh, on examination. Uh, You look for a red throat, enlarged tonsils, swollen glands in the neck. 
And then fourthly, and this doesn't always happen because sometimes the symptoms and the signs are enough for you to know what it is, but you can uh, move on to ordering uh, any necessary tests. Um, blood tests, uh, a throat swab. Uh, if you're on a, an American medical drama, you'd get a full body CT scan, but usually you don't have to do that in New Zealand. Um, and then finally what you do is you put the symptoms, the signs, and any test results together, and you form a diagnosis. And that is what you base your treatment plan on. And so here we go in a nice uh, kind of pie chart. Uh, you'll see that in adults, less than 20% of sore throats are bacterial and need antibiotics. More than 80% are viral and don't need antibiotics. On the other hand, there's a tiny fraction that can develop abscesses that require urgent draining or some other really rare but quite serious condition that needs to be treated. Uh, sometimes, uh, rarely, a cancer in the throat might start as a, as a th sore throat, hence the asking about other questions, difficulty swallowing and things. Even though I haven't gone through that process in a clinical setting in about 18 years, it all came rushing back to me recently when I find when I found myself in that time last year trying to work out the why behind a non-medical symptom, grumpiness. So I'm going to retrace an autobiographical journey as I walk you from a symptom to a diagnosis and then on to a treatment plan. So I've already confessed, but I might as well do it twice. Uh, I got really grumpy uh, during the four-week level four lockdown back in April uh, of last year. Was it the four-week one that was the longer? It was the second one and the one that went longer. Um, and I'm not talking about a Disney-style sn uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves grumpy. I'm talking that sort of full-on feral grumpiness uh, that can set in. Uh, when you lie awake at night and ruminate on just how unfair your life is. Uh, when you consider quitting your job and selling the kids on Trade Me. Um, <laughs> The sort of grumpiness, and maybe we've got Disney to blame for this, but the very word grumpiness doesn't seem to do it justice. Grumpiness sounds too cute. Um, it's seldom as clean or as binary as my Sunday school song about being humbly grateful or grumbly hateful boil down to. It's the sort of grumpiness that reduces down deep inside into this kind of dark, thick stew and it's got lots of other stuff uh, floating around inside of it. Anger, impatience, there's agitation, there's frustration, there's resentment. And not much of the spirit-born fruit floating around in there. Not a lot of love, joy, peace, or patience. I think what made it worse during that time was realizing on a global scale just how good we had it as well. So I was feeling this kind of deep kind of agitation and frustration and anger and resentment, but I was looking around going, man, I've just got no real reason on a global scale to be feeling this way, and yet there it was. Now, I'm not sure uh, where you're at at the moment. Uh, I've decided, and in chatting with Stan, to bring this out as my offering as part of your winter collective because I've noticed it sort of revisiting, and it sometimes does that towards the end of our program, because we've been running hard for seven months. Uh, the summer seems like a million years ago by the time late June hits, and I just find that it's just coming back and revisiting on me. Um, you may not be in a season like that yourself, but I hope some of what I share might help to arm you for your next season of it, or you may well be deep in a season of grumpiness right now. I don't know. Did Stan didn't give me any names of people he thought I should be <laughs> speaking specifically to this morning. Um, but if that is you, you've got even less reason because you live on the coast. And the coast is like Auckland's worst kept secret. Like everyone wants to be where you are and we can't um, for all sorts of reasons. But shame on you <laughs> if you've ever had a grumpy day in your life uh, while living uh, here. I've had plenty of seasons uh, of grumpiness. Last year, was, uh, it was a pretty deep and dark one, uh, but it was my, by no means my first. And one of the things I learned after coming back to, back to faith in my late 20s, I'd had a, a, about a, a prodigal decade, and I came back to, back to faith in my late 20s. Now, one of the things that took me 
uh, quite a while to learn was that grumpiness is a symptom, it's not a diagnosis. There's usually something else going on, uh, well, there always is something else going on uh, that is making one grumpy. What took me even longer than that, in fact, more than a decade, was developing the maturity to actually uh, patiently uh, kind of handle a process uh, of assessing that symptom and making a diagnosis, trying to correctly identify the why. And it's something that I still really wrestle with, uh, as good friends and family will attest to. So on to the diagnosis. Um, well, there were a couple of things that I noticed uh, during that lockdown season of grumpiness. The first was that I didn't seem to be the only one who was brewing a stew. Uh, it might have been slightly distorted by my own kind of grey uh, outlook. Uh, maybe it was a variation on the takes one to no one cliche, but it suddenly seemed like grumpiness was everywhere. And I was noticing other people uh, feel a real agitation as well. And kind of fuses were short uh, in a lot of the areas uh, that I kind of interacted with and the communities that I was a part of. The second thing that I noticed uh, was that a number of these people uh, were, were misdiagnosing the why, uh, in my humble opinion. Uh, but looking kind of uh, sideways at them, uh, I, I noticed people were blaming their jobs uh, or there was a specific colleague uh, at work. Uh, or it was their church, uh, or their flatmate. And again, observing from the outside, and uh, certainly not doing a much better job of diagnosing my why, but at least uh, kind of trying not to rush into that diagnosis, that was about the only thing I had on them, so this is not a, a judgmental thing, but I was watching going, I think you're being a bit too quick to try and diagnose uh, what's going on. Uh, I wasn't doing much better, but I was trying to wait. Uh, it's not just uh, Bible geeks that want to inflict Greek on you. I'm not sure whether um, uh, Stan, Matt, Jacinda and others uh, do that to you um, and actually sort of uh, inflict Greek on you for some of the original words out of the, the New Testament, but medical geeks want to inflict uh, Greek on you as well. So here we go. Uh, here's some Greek uh, from which we get our word uh, diagnosis. So dia, a part, and then gignoskin, which is to know or to recognize. So a, a diagnosis or to diagnose is literally to know apart from another, to be able to discern or distinguish something as different from something else. And part of life is just learning how to, uh, how to do that well. And we start doing it with very simple things like diagnosing differences in size or diagnosing differences in shape. And you'll watch and uh, as parents or grandparents take great delight in watching your well above average kid um, learn to fit a shape into the right kind of hole in the block set, or diagnosing differences in color. All of this is coming down to knowing apart from something else, from being able to discern what the difference is. Given the complexity of the human body, it's, it's little wonder that we spend uh, six years at medical school, uh, and that being the bare minimum, and recalling those days of being kind of thrust out for your first year as a, a medical officer, uh, you kind of sat there on that first day wishing it had been more like 12 years. Given the complexity sometimes, though, of our grumpiness stews, it's little wonder that diagnosing that can take some time as well. So here's just a couple of things that I have picked up over the years and then found myself having to go back over and rehearse uh, during that time last year. And the first one I've touched on already, and that's that good diagnosis can take time. When grumpiness bubbles up or it descends like a fog, and I find both of those metaphors at once are helpful. So this thing is kind of bubbling up from the bottom and kind of coming out and oozing over everything, but it's kind of like a fog has descended as well, and you're really struggling uh, to see clearly. It's unlikely... Uh, that you're going to make a quick and correct di diagnosis. It'll be one or the other. <laughs> uh, if it's quick, it's usually not correct. If it's correct, it's oftentimes not been quick. Uh, we have to learn how to wait in that thick stew 
or that fog, and that can be tough. Uh, This is one of the few areas in my life in which I've noticed some modest growth, and that's no small thing for an impulsive ENFP. I have written dozens of resignation letters and scathing emails over the years, but thankfully only in my imagination. It's a, it's a good place to pre-write them. Five minutes won't cut it when it comes to waiting. I've, I've literally waited weeks and sometimes months to try and make some sense of what's going on and why there is such a sense of kind of agitation uh, and, and resentment going on. We'd do well to heed uh, the instruction of James again as he kind of turns the heat up a little later in the opening chapter of his epistle. And I read the verses uh, earlier where he says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, sometimes the anger's there. That's part of the stew. Uh, But if you can slow down the acting on that, Uh, the quitting of the job, the um, moving out of the flat, the whatever it is that you're wanting to impulsively do, uh, because that will often be based on a misdiagnosis. The second thing I've learned is to ask the question, is the problem external or is it internal? The righteousness that James is talking about, uh, what might that look like? Well, I've found it difficult to even begin answering that question well if, I've, if I'm convinced that every time the why of my grumpiness uh, is lying outside of myself, it's got to be something external to me. It's usually not. Again, I've learned this the hard way to ask the question, is it possible that in the midst of this stew, God might be highlighting something in me that needs to change? something in me that needs to die, something in me that needs to be repented of. Those aren't comfortable questions to be asking, but neither is draining an abscess. But it's necessary discomfort. We're going to get to treatment uh, in a moment. But again, as we heard at the start, James sets the bar high here. When tests and troubles uh, come your way from all sides, friends, consider it a sheer gift. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced out into the open and, I should have highlighted this, shows its true colors. You know what's really going on when the heat gets turned up. Uh, Anyone uh, can act the fruit of the Spirit in good times. It's hard to do them under pressure. It's hard to do them in difficult times. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Paul and Peter issues similar challenges in their letters in the New Testament. It turns out that the mirror is a good place to start. Now, sometimes there will be an external component to it. I'm, I'm not saying there won't be. Sometimes it is time to change job or to boot out that flatmate. Uh, But oftentimes there is at least an element where God is trying to also highlight something in us that needs to change as well. The third uh, point I want to make, I've I've called an enemy did this. It's a line out of Matthew uh, 13, 28. At one point during that time last year when the the stew or the fog seemed its thickest and its most impenetrable. Uh, And again, a scathing email was threatening to break out of my imagination and into reality. I remember waking. I was doing a lot of waking early in the morning and just lying in bed, (laughs) stewing. And I remember sitting there one morning, lying in bed one morning, and I just had the sense that I should go and read the parable of the wheat and the weeds or the wheat and the tares as some of the older uh, versions uh, put it. Many of you will be familiar with that parable. Uh, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, don't you sow good seed? didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? 
an enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. It's one of the few parables that comes with a a specific explanation. But I was challenged by a couple of things that related to my situation. The first was that in seasons like this, it can be even more difficult than usual to distinguish and disentangle wheat from weeds. Uh, That can be just really difficult to do. Even though the parable is about something else, it it reminded me to be patient, to go back to our sort of point number one, to slow things down. Wheat and weeds will declare themselves in time. But a, a, a rash decision to sort of rush in and pull out a misdiagnosed weed, like a job or a church or a flatmate, you might discover it was wheat after all. You might make that change impulsively and realize down the track Actually, the problem remains, and it had very little to do with what uh, you had diagnosed it, misdiagnosed it as. The second challenge uh, to me was that in assessing the stew of my life, everything that was going on, the kind of the, the bird's nest of feelings and thoughts and kind of changing things as we went through that, that difficult period last year, My life isn't just made up of me and others and circumstances and God. I haven't listed those in order of importance, by the way. Um, But there is another variable. It was an enemy that came and sowed the weeds. An enemy that Jesus tells us in John's Gospel speaks lies as his natural language and comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Peter's warning is similarly blunt. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. A few days after reading that parable, I realized just through a series of divinely timed conversations that three close friends and I had been hit with debilitating discouragement and agitation around about the same time. That might be coincidence, but I've experienced the enemy sowing not divine but diabolically timed weeds often enough to know that this is a variable to be taken seriously. The enemy has no interest in you staying in the job that God wants you staying in. The enemy has no interest in you staying in the church that God wants you to remain planted in or the home group that you're a part of and will use anything to have you misconstrue something or misdiagnose something and move on. He speaks lies as his natural language and comes to steal, to kill and to destroy everything from you. And that's worth remembering when you're sitting in a place feeling an agitation just seemingly coming out of nowhere or when you're blindsided by it. Number four, I've called eliminate life-threatening conditions to go back to our sort of medical uh, kind of way of speaking about this. Um, Going back to our sore throat and talking you through the the sort of the pie chart, uh, I might have overemphasized the need for a specific diagnosis. It actually turns out that there are hundreds of viruses that can give you uh, a sore throat, but we actually don't bother to find out which one. And the reason we don't do that is because we've ruled out the really negative options, we've ruled out the tumors, the abscesses, the bacterial infections, and so it doesn't really matter which of the minor viruses it is because the treatment plan is the same. It's paracetamol plus rest, and soothing drinks of the patient's choice. In such cases, viral sore throat is a perfectly valid diagnosis. 
Now, you know, people in medicine, and it's changed a lot since I was practicing it, but we can run uh, kind of assays to work out which virus it is. We could spend hundreds working out specifically what virus you've got, but it doesn't matter because we don't do anything different. It's paracetamol, um, go and have a uh, kind of, you know, uh, a hot lemon drink or mulled wine, whatever it is that you're uh, sort of choosing, and, uh, and some bed rest, which, again, people don't want to hear, but that's part of the <laughs> thing as well. Well, so it is with grumpiness. That timely parable helped me to recognize uh, and receive some prayer and encouragement for the distorting weeds of the enemy. I had ruled out other external causes as significant factors. That is, my job wasn't killing me, nor were my kids. And ongoing prayer and reflection where I could, where I could manage it, and I wasn't having, you know, um, sort of record-breaking times of uh, devotional um, life at the time, I can tell you, but discussing it with Jules and others made it pretty clear that God wasn't nudging me towards any major external changes. And so it didn't really matter what other non-life-threatening viruses were floating in the stew. I was able to ride out the rest of that season. Having eliminated those life-threatening ones, I was able to similarly just take some para paracetamol, a drink of my choice, and chalk it up to viral grumpiness. Now, I've put paracetamol uh, in inverted commas because I'm going to uh, move on to treatment, and my title's given it away. What I want to suggest is that gratitude is the catch-all paracetamol uh, for grumpiness and should be uh, part of any treatment plan for grumpiness. I think familiarity with both gratitude and paracetamol uh, has bred some contempt. Paracetamol is the most commonly used medication around the world for pain relief, and it can be, in some instances, remarkably effective. Now, a study just came out a few months ago since I uh, wrote this, um, where uh, a, a crowd in Australia had actually been fined for overselling uh, the results of paracetamol and for branding things specifically. So there are some pains that don't respond well to paracetamol. Uh, but it's still routinely used as the uh, first-line treatment plan in any post-operative patient. You get a gram of paracetamol uh, four times a day, and then other medications, other pain reliefs are loaded on top of that. So you'll be pleased to know if you've got a uh, surgery coming up in the next week. while well, you don't just get paracetamol, but you load it up on top of that, and then gradually you come off the other stuff, and paracetamol's uh, usually the, the last to go. Uh, again, that might have changed, but that's how I uh, recall things. And um, it's the same paracetamol that you buy at the supermarket. And yet I find that friends and family will often turn their noses up when I suggest it as the first choice. Uh, they, they want me to suggest something that befits the grandeur of their condition. And I always say, no, we'll start with that and let's see how we go. We can, we can build up from that. Likewise, the unassuming little tablet of gratitude is remarkably effective, but it's similarly underappreciated. It can often single-handedly deal with most of the non-life-threatening viruses that I've mentioned uh, that were floating in my stew. Anger, impatience, agitation, frustration, resentment. Sorry, sound guys. I'm going to have to blow my nose, so I'm just going to turn off. There we go. Better than leaving it on. I did once wear it into the toilet and uh, it does indeed capture the sound of everything, um, as I was told later. Not only does gratitude kind of, um, is, a, is a treatment for sort of non-specific viral grumpiness, but it's remarkably effective against some of those other things that I mentioned were floating around in my stew as well. Anger, impatience, agitation, frustration, uh, resentment. Gratitude has long been valued as a spiritual practice. Uh, location doesn't necessarily indicate importance, but it's interesting 
that uh, pastor theologian Lynn Barb begins her book, Joy Together, uh, a book on spiritual practices for your congregation with a chapter titled Thankfulness. Um, Adele Alberg Cahoon covers more than 50 practices and exercises in her spiritual disciplines handbook, uh, and gratitude is second. Like many commentators, both authors use gratitude and thankfulness synonymously and highlight its importance. Cahoon writes, Thankfulness is a thread that can bind together all the patchwork squares of our lives. Difficult times, happy days, seasons of sickness, hours of bliss, all can be sewn together into something lovely with the thread of thankfulness. Both authors also agree that the inner attitude requires outward expression. It's no good just being or thinking you're being uh, grateful uh, in your heart. Sometimes it actually needs to come out. And there can be a two-way movement here. Thanksgiving will naturally flow out of a heart uh, that is filled with gratitude, but I've found sometimes I need to use it another way and use the expression of gratitude to be something that over time fills my heart with gratitude. I need to think my way into a feeling of gratitude rather than waiting for it to just come oozing out of a heart that's just overflowing with it. Thomas Aquinas linked the virtue of gratitude to justice. There's a rendering of that which is due. And oh, how much, he writes, oh, how much is due. George Herbert prays, Thou hast given given so much to me, give me one more thing, a grateful heart. The Old Testament prophets repeatedly urged the people to remember what God had done for them, to avoid what Lynn Barb called the idolatry of amnesia. We are ones, we were reminded during communion, who are supposed to remember. God knows we're forgetful, and we are to remember the good that has happened in our lives. One in five of the Psalms specifically mentions giving thanks. Almost all of them contain praise, which we're going to close with uh, in a few moments, um, which again either emanates from gratitude or helps us to cultivate it. Many times the New Testament writers instruct or model giving thanks for and giving thanks in all things. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus out of Thessalonians. And so having made my case for this humble little tablet, I'll just close now with a couple of exercises that have helped me to to swallow the tablet, to actually swallow uh, the paracetamol. How are we going for time? We got five minutes for me to to wrap up. Uh, The first one is praise. Um, As all of this was unfolding, I felt God inviting me to make praise one of the ways that I was going to get out of the stew. More specifically, I was reminded of the scripture and song choruses of the 1970s and 80s, uh, which we still have a book of at home. And some of you might remember the cover to that scripture and song book. I can only play four chords on the guitar, and I haven't sung most of those songs since I was growing up in church in the late 70s and 80s, but I've managed to remember by looking at the the lyrics of those songs, dozens and dozens of them, which says a lot more about the simplicity of songs back then than it does about my strumming uh, or my memory. Uh, It looks and sounds terrible. I do it before anyone else is up in the house uh, and so that no one else uh, has to put up with it. Um, But it's had a remarkable effect. Uh, I did that for a couple of months, and I've returned to it this winter. Um, It sounds terrible. Uh, It doesn't look or sound cool. But that's not really the point with praise. If you're wondering how you look as you you praise, uh, you've probably missed the point. (laughs) Number two, prayer. Again, uh, we can and do do whole sermon series on prayer. Uh, but a couple of quick suggestions. Lynn Barb writes movingly about the ways in which her personal uh, and prayer life, uh, her personal family and congregational prayer times were transformed when her and her husband committed to starting every prayer time with thanks. Think of something to be grateful for at the start before launching into any other area of prayer. Um, Secondly, uh, Google Listen of Thanks, and you'll find prayers that itemize things to be thankful for. And they're really useful. They're really helpful. They often will start inwards and move out. So personal life, family, community, nation, global. Or they'll start out and move in. 
Uh, Psalm 136 is an example from Scripture of a litany of praise that actually lists some things to be thankful for. And then thirdly, um, I can't really move on without emphasizing the importance of receiving prayer from others. Our our faith is lived in community, and we desperately need the encouragement uh, of others to be praying for us. Sometimes we don't have the, the energy or the faith to be praying meaningfully ourselves, and we need to be just receiving that. For about four months after lockdown last year, unless I was speaking, I went forward every Sunday to receive prayer. I was just like, I just need to be positioning myself somewhere where someone else can be doing some of this praying and believing for me and with me. My third point, uh, speaking of others, is that we should be thanking others. Uh, While we're, um, you know, talking about community, um, I'd say again, gratitude is underdeveloped if it's expressed only to God for what God has done in our lives, and never to others about what they are doing in our lives as well. Thankless communities are hardly communities at all. Uh, And again, this is a two-way movement. Don't wait uh, for feelings of thankfulness to come gushing out of an overflowing heart. Sometimes you need to thank someone in order to develop that uh, gratitude for them. It's hard to stay grumpy at people if we're constantly thanking them. And then lastly, uh, and this is one that others have picked up better than I, but a gratitude journal. Uh, All of those people I mentioned who have written books on this recommend uh, keeping a a gratitude journal. Uh, I hate journaling, uh, so what I did instead over that lockdown time was that I uh, employed my trusty iPhone 7 to keep not a written journal, uh, but a photographic one. And so every day I just took a picture of something that I was grateful for. Uh, A warm fire on a cold May morning. Psalm 136, the kids packing their Sylvanian family's car like dad packs it for holiday. <clears throat> Our bread maker over lockdown. Uh, a morning sunrise where the sun, uh, sky just goes fluorescent pink. Uh, the only remaining flowers in May in our garden. Just some things to be just kind of little out of focus uh, shots, but just reminded me of things uh, to be grateful for. I want to close uh, as I just invite the, the band to come up. We are going to close just with a, with a song of praise this morning. But I want to close <clears throat> where, we, uh, where we started this morning out of Romans 5, uh, 3 to 5. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Again, I don't know exactly where you're at uh, this morning uh, when it comes to the scale of sort of grumpiness through to gratitude. Um, hopefully I've explained my journey last year in, a, in enough detail that there's, there's no judgment from the front here. Um, but I just want us to take just a moment uh, just to think of the, some things that whether we're in a, a season of grumpiness or not, just some things that we can be grateful for. Some things that we can just offer up uh, to God in gratitude. Um, we'll just do that for, you know, 20, 30 seconds, uh, and then I'll I'll pray uh, and invite the team to, to take us into praise. Father, there's so much that we could sit here listing if we were to engage our own litany of praise and to give that some thought and time and get on a roll, there would be just so much we would want to list. And yet, Father, for some of us here, um, 
Those things will be hard to list because there's other stuff going on that's creating that stew, that's creating uh, the fog. And we want to lift that up to you as well. We want to lift that up with thanksgiving. We want to thank you for seeing that, God, for seeing us in that space. We ask you, God, for, uh, for the patience to sit in that space and to diagnose well to listen to what it is you're wanting us to learn and to see and to discern in that season. Father, I pray that those who are, who are sitting in that space and don't really have the energy even really to perhaps to pray for themselves, that they might have the courage to uh, invite prayer in, uh, to get others around them to be praying for them in a season where uh, perspective has been slightly uh, knocked askew by the circumstances of life. We thank you, God, that you are with us, whether or not it seems as though your, your nearness is tangible. The scandal of the Christian life isn't so much, God, that we claim you exist, but we claim to do life with you. We claim you do life with us. We claim you're, you're with us in that. And so we lift up our season now, one, whether it's one of, of being in a stew, whether it's one of uh, enjoying some respite and some, some spaciousness and some lightness. But God, we thank you that you're uh, in it with us. We give you glory. Praise is a, a fitting place for us to close this morning. Amen. As the team uh, just leads us in a in a song of praise, and it is a good place to, to finish, to close, to actually end in praise. If, if you do want prayer, and I know that the, the team will um, echo my, my invitation, uh, do come on down. Uh, if not during the song, then, then after it. Um, and, you know, I make that invitation broad. Uh, you're not fessing up to being the grumpiest person in the room if you come down. Uh, it can be an invitation to come and just receive prayer for, for any part of life where perspective is lost or it seems hard or you feel as though you're in the fog or stew. Thanks, guys.